Okay. All right, everybody, um, we're, we're going to get started here. If you are in this room, you are now participating in workshop number 450. Excuse me, we're getting started here. Thank you. Um, if you're here now, you're, get, um, you're participating in workshop 450, Fostering Digital Social Innovation in the Global South. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a cool 90 minutes to close out this second day um, of this IGF. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Jan Gerlach. I'm a senior public policy manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the organization um, that hosts and supports Wikipedia. Um, I am not the only organizer of this session. Um, I'm here joined by Sandra Cortesi from the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard and by Christian Fiesler of the Norwegian Business School in Oslo. Um, we're here to talk about digital social innovation, but since we're sort of a, um, I guess, cozy, smallish group, um, maybe we can go through the room um, and do a quick introduction. Everybody say their name, where they're from, what they do. Um, just a very short line. And um, after that, um, we'll have um, Christian talk about the actual concept of digital social innovation, what this is all about. And we'll um, hear from a couple of speakers um, and what they do in this context and their approach to the topic. Um, why don't we start um, with our two uh, co-organizers. Um, say a few words about yourself, please. Hi, I'm uh, Sandra Cortesi uh, from the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, uh, leading the Youth and Media Project there, but also doing uh, mostly Latin America work. Um, my name is Akua Walters. I'm from Jamaica. Um, I run a small um, software firm called Hacker Hostel. What we do is we go into um, uh, emerging markets, developing markets, and we train uh, software um, engineers um, there, yes. My name is Stefan Colomatillon from Kiwix. We do internet content for people without internet access, which means offline distributions. My name is Thomas Gunn. I'm from Ethiopia, uh, 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 University of Pan African University. Uh, uh, we did on the issue of uh, digital, uh, bridging the digital divide, particularly in the uh, African and the global south. Hello, everyone. My name is Lois, and I'm from Uganda. I work with the Collaboration International ICT Policy. Uh, we do research and uh, promote digital rights in Africa. My name is uh, Alexa Hassi, and I'm joining my colleagues uh, Sandra and Andreas from the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Hello all, my name is Lionel Brosi. I'm part of the steering committee of Conectados al Sur Network and also a professor at the University of Chile. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Christian Fieseler, and I'm um, a professor in Oslo for communication and management, and I'm happy to work together with Sandra, Pinda, and Jan on this topic here today on digital social innovation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andres Lombana Bermudez. I am a fellow at the Berman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and I work with Sandra and Alexa at the Youth and Media team. Uh, I am originally from Colombia, and I do research in Latin America as well. Good afternoon. My name is Jorge Vargas, and I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. I work in partnerships in emerging markets. I handle the portfolio in Latin America as well as uh, work around some other partnerships on a, a global scale and some issues around policy. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Jenner. I'm an internet and media researcher based in Zurich, Switzerland. Good afternoon, my name is Carlton Samuels. I teach part-time at the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica. And I work in development, uh, mostly focused on developing uh, people for the digital economy. Um, I'm Pinda Wong from Hong Kong, uh, made in Hong Kong, I guess. Uh, I'm here as, I guess, a steering committee member of the Digital Asia Hub, which is an independent and interdisciplinary research effort based on digital technology in Hong Kong. And uh, my current interest is in um, blockchain and cryptographic currencies. Thank you. Hey. 
Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Ricardo Zapata from Colombia too, <laughs> two of the guests. Uh, I'm currently studying public policy and new technologies in CNSPO. Hi, I'm Rafael Palomino. I'm from Mexico and I study public policy at the Heritage School of Governance in Berlin. Hi everyone, my name is Weiwei Wu. I'm from the United States and I'm um, currently studying at American University um, focusing on ICT 4D. Hi everyone, I'm Ivan. I work, I'm a marketing manager for Tech Policy Consultancy Access Partnership based in London. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Wai Min Kwok. Uh, I'm with the UN Secretariat, uh, Department of Economy and Social Affairs uh, Division for Public Institutions and Digital Governments, also supporting the IGF Secretariat. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Chibuzo Njoku. Uh, I'm a youth IGF for over 2018, and I'm currently interested in data science and digital inclusion. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Luisa from the Institute for Research on Internet and Society based on, in Brazil. Um, we are interested on digital rights as well and currently we are studying digital inclusion and digital literacy. Good afternoon, I'm Daphne Solvino. I work for the Dutch government for the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. Good afternoon. My name is Joshua. I'm from Uganda. My organization, TIFAT, works with farmers. We connect them to, bu to buyers via an SMS technology. I also work with Internet Society Uganda chapter as a secretary general, and I'm here as the 2018 IGF ambassador. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Thomas Kerry Wilson, and I study politics at the University of Sussex in England. Hi, I'm Deepak Maheshwari. I'm based in Delhi, India. I had government affairs for Symantec in India, ASEAN and China. That's my day job. My night job is a, as a global chair of IEEE Internet Initiative. Um, and uh, I've been involved in internet policy for more than two decades now. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Ria Yaocheng. Uh, I head up a foundation called Covella Foundation. And my interest is in technology and development for the Caribbean. Hello, my name is Alan Barrett. I'm from AFRINIC, the regional internet registry um, allocating IP numbers in Africa. And um, we're also interested in general development in Africa. Hello, I'm Micaela. I recently graduated in political economy. I'm currently working at Uber in their user operations team in New York. Um, I'm just here to learn about just different topics regarding the internet. Um, I'm also very interested in how innovation is rolling out in Latin America, Asia, China in particular. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Henna. Uh, I'm researching internet access and gender at Goldsmiths College in London. Thank you everybody for this short round of introductions. I think we definitely fulfill the IGF's requirements for diversity and um, for multi-stakeholder approach. Um, this is really exciting. Um, and um, I want to kick it off here now or throw the ball to Christian to actually tell us about digital social innovation. Um, what is this about, Christian? May I have a point? little bit of a technical hiccup, here we go. So um, what we thought to do is kind of like give you a little bit of an idea what the term might mean for us, but we are of course really interested in learning from you how we can define digital social innovation, what that might be, and how technology might help to solve grand challenges like poverty, like inclusion, like um, access to knowledge. And um, the idea, or at least our kind of like working definition of digital social inclusion is the idea of um, turning around maybe a little bit the idea of um, creating top-down solutions, essentially giving ready-made solutions to people, but thinking how can we maybe empower people to, for instance, come up with innovative products, services, processes, business models. And by um, people, we mean essentially people who we would normally not readily 
conceptualize as entrepreneurs, right? Think about people who, for instance, uh, get access to uh, technology in the favela. I think you, Andres, also told me the story of maker spaces in favelas where um, kind of like on one day you had a maker board standing there, on the next day the maker board was more or less gone, on the third day it was essentially reassembled and standing there because all the kids were so interested in learning the technology and getting um, a little bit to play around with it, right? And the idea would be to talk today about how can we use maybe the creative um, potentials of technology to um, empower people to essentially improve maybe well-being, the agency of the socially disadvantaged people. Um, of course, um, there can be many, many, many fields where we could potentially think about technology helping grand challenges like starting from, for instance, empowering people um, to maybe create their own entrepreneurial projects around government accountability, uh, civil society accountability like open data projects, agriculture ideas or, for instance, giving farmers local uh, language information via telephones or so, kind of like how to farm, how to do um, agriculture, how to do agriculture, how to do um, mariculture, aquaculture, and so on and so forth. The ideas of the potentials of participatory economies, sharing economy, is there anything where we could use um, that to empower people in the global south going to manufacturing the potentials of maker spaces, maker bots, um, media, so many, many of course, ideas and fields for us to explore. And the idea behind that today would be to talk about how can we empower people better, right? And I think also the our idea would be to talk a little bit about skills, if you would mind, um, in that um, when we try to conceptualize a little bit about what we are talking, I think uh, coming up with entrepreneurial solutions has a lot to do with ideation, right? The idea is to how do we enable people to come up with creative ideas? How do we foster creative skills, especially in kids and young people, in youth, and not only help them to be creative, but um, think about the next steps, right? Making them able to prototype the ideas, have something tangible for them to show, maybe also something to collaborate on that idea, and also giving them the, and I don't want to sound too academic, but giving them the means of production, right? Thinking about whether there's any way of fabrication, meaning that um, is there any ready access to essentially scale their ideas. May it be media products, may it be any kind of like handicraft, but uh, what is there in technology to enable access to knowledge, but also enable access to production. I think the big question there when we try to uh, foster more digital social innovation would be how can we do that in a sustainable manner, right? Because of course there is different kinds of like innovation that ideally would look at ways of innovation that also foster the United Nations development goals and sustainability goals. Can we uh, combine entrepreneurship with eco-solution, social solution, but also sustainable solution in terms of the careers which we are building when we ask people to act entrepreneurial with digital technology? Is there anything we need to consider when we talk about the scalability of um, entrepreneurial activities? Yesterday we had a session shared by Sandra Cortesi um, where we talked about young people and their um, entrepreneurial activities like on media, right? On, for instance, video games, streaming, blogging, and so on and so forth. And the idea is always how easily can that be scaled? Can we also think about um, maybe business models, services, which are not only companies of one, but where we essentially um, create kind of like little cooperatives, little firms. Uh, how can we essentially go from enabling just one person to make a living to um, having people maybe build little communities of practice, little, little firms or something like that. And um, then the idea also, how do we uh, consider success and how do we combine, if we talk about social innovation, how do we combine uh, entrepreneurial success, monetary success with the social mission, right? Is it only um, kind of like talking that, um, so, so is it about kind of like creating good businesses or is it creating uh, social businesses where I think we think that uh, the one should not exclude the other, right? Kind of like that we think about um, essentially making something which is long-term economically feasible. And um, I think a good way to kind of like also consider that would be to think about how do we um, essentially enable people, right, in terms of skills. And that's now maybe a little bit playful, but um, I think we tend to discuss a lot about safe practices, right? The essentially the um, idea to be able to participate, but that is essentially just 
in our definition, at least for today, the uh, grounds in which essentially entrepreneurship could grow. But the seed would be, for instance, enabling creative practices, kind of like instilling maybe also the desire to come up with ideas, to be entrepreneurial, to uh, rejigger business, to learn about technology in the hope then to essentially grow that into something sustainability, in, into something sustainable. And that is what we think are also strategic practices or strategic skills, meaning that it's on the one hand, of course, always advisable and good to talk about how can people create with technology content, right? How can they um, bring content on the internet? How can they use maker spaces and so on and so forth? But I think when we talk about enabling, empowering people, we need also to talk about um, scaling skills, business skills, right? Kind of like growing your creativity, your content production into something which might enable you, but also maybe your friends, your colleagues in um, making a living, finding a um, payback from entrepreneurial skills, right? And that has also a lot to do not only with getting a good product out, but actually also placing the product, making the product heard, making people excited about the product, essentially positioning yourself, right? Um, many, many different components actually fall under that, right? And we, I think, in the last two days already discussed a lot the idea of, for instance, artificial intelligence, right? How can artificial intelligences of any kind help their, or do they actually counteract the idea of people being entrepreneurial? Is it something that there might not be a market anymore when uh, everything can be done by AIs? Or to, uh, to the opposite, could that be a good tool to skill people to become more entrepreneurial? Then the idea of platforms, right? Um, the idea like um, we you now have our dear friends also from Wikimedia talking a little bit about that, how can knowledge platforms, open platforms, or closed platforms, I think we also need to do that discussion. How can they help to uh, give people knowledge, access to knowledge, but also access to markets in a way, right? Because a lot of markets are in a way somewhat, not always maybe easy to uh, crack or to enter for people. And I think an important question, especially when we talk about the Global South, is also looking at mobile first solutions, right? Solutions which um, are in a way lightweight and that they can be enabled through minimal technology like mobile, but also having enough of a technolo te technological capability or technological affordance so that people um, are not only consumers of content, but can also create content themselves. Um, kind of like clothing, and that's more kind of like the spirit of the discussion to be uh, coming. I think the idea when we talk now about um, digital social innovation with all of you, learning also from all of you guys, uh, would be to maybe grow a little, put a little seed into the, into the ground and kind of like let something grow, right? Kind of like essentially think a little bit about how we can help grow entrepreneurial ecosystems through digital technology. And um, an important part, at least in our definition of that, is that entrepreneurial activity needs a little bit of gardening, right? If, especially when we talk about digital technology, what kind of um, safeguards do we need? What kind of like um, gardening do we need in the sense of good practices, of having spaces where um, actually entrepreneurship can grow? And kind of closing off, I think, the discussion which we should take, and maybe we should also have as questions here, would be on the one hand the question of um, yeah, how do we create inclusive social innovations, inclusive business models, inclusive services? Then how can we also instill values in them, meaning that um, can we create businesses which kind of like can combine a social mission, an educational mission with um, the idea of earning money and becoming maybe successful, becoming another big or medium-sized company at least, and how finally we can um, implement that in technology which is lightweight enough for people to actually use it, right, in spaces where there might not be the technological um, backbone to do that. I think then I give uh, back to Jan. What? <laughs> Microphone didn't want to let me speak, so. It, <laughs> thank you, thank you, it's on. <laughs> anyway, thank you, uh, Christian, for this uh, very helpful overview. Um, 
when when we um, first started, I think talking about this, I had no clue, and I really looked for you for guidance. So this is really helpful, uh, hopefully for everybody in the room. Um, I um, want to actually not talk too much myself at all, uh, but rather um, now hand it over to our uh, two speakers here um, to talk about their um, vision of digital social innovation, their approach to it, um, and maybe Pindar, you can start us off here um, and, and talk about, um, I think you've prepared a, a short statement. Um, and which, yeah. which I'll prepare to throw away, as we always do. And so throw it's away. going to be very, 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 yeah, very, very lightweight. So thank you very much for that. And Christian, I, I loved uh, your opening remarks, and I was trying to follow along. Um, I would just like to pick up on, on one of the themes, which was the theme of empowerment and innovation, um, and try and tie that with uh, the, the space that I've been exploring for the last uh, uh, a few years, which was the space of, of cryptocurrencies uh, and this, uh, this empty buzzword that we have, which is called blockchain. So the, the notion here, I think what's different with the internet, uh, or what we used to talk about, was permissionless innovation at the edge, right? You have, this, you have this network which everyone can connect to, and then you just kind of, you know, it didn't require permission to connect, and you kind of this. It's kind of like this myth that we have that keeps the, the internet going. So we have the sort of the, the, the pre-internet era and the post-internet era, and I would say that uh, we have a pre-Bitcoin era and a post-Bitcoin era. Why? Because we have these now, this, this capacity to sort of literally make money um, there are 2,000 different cryptocurrencies right now. Uh, making money right now is like a command line. You literally type make money, enter. The question is, can you deploy it? And so we've moved from an era of permissionless innovation to one of uh, potentially permissionless monetization. Right? We have a, a, a plethora of cryptocurrencies which now enable us to exchange value across borders. And I think that's important to enable the global south because you mentioned the means of production, but there's also the means of exchange. How can I exchange what goods or services that I produce, which are increasingly digital, right? Nearly all the work that we produce now begins its life, not on pen and paper, I'm old school, but it really begins on, on, on a laptop somewhere, right? So the, the provenance of the development of intangible assets, you know, the sort of copyright and all the stuff that we can do, we now have a big ability to sort of track and trace the whole supply chain of that. We can now move manufacturing from traditional supply chains to demand chains. In other words, we can move the means of production to where there are customers and print it out or manufacture or fabricate them. You mentioned Fab Lab several times, where there is markets. So the geographical distinction is one I actually have an issue with, which is sort of uh, the global south, right? What does that mean? Because in the internet, you know, we kill geography. Right? You know, the assumption in the, in, the, in, the, in the wars that I was involved with in the 90s was the telco world, where distance equals cost. Right? And you picked up the phone, you made a long distance phone call, and you bled money. Nowadays, we're streaming this, this, this video conference all over the world, and we don't care. So the point here is, what assumptions are we going to make? Because if we make the wrong set of assumptions, all right, or uh, if we don't identify what the new assumptions are that empower those who are, I would call, netizens, right, or netizen expats, these people who are connecting to the network now, many from uh, countries, the next billion online, then I think we're going to be making thinking mistakes. So let me give you three examples. The first one was in the era of telephone call, the assumption that data equals, uh, distance equals cost, right? We destroyed that. And if you understood that, you could have made a lot of money through ISPs. What are other ones? Well, I'm from Hong Kong, right? I'm made in Hong Kong. So it's a financial center, and one of the key assumptions is, is what? Right? It's time is money, right? It's so basic. But I've been involved with Bitcoin, which is, well, data equals money. For the very first time, we actually have a mechanism, not sort of hand-wavy that Google and Facebook are monetizing your data. No, we have 6,500 bucks US to write into a blockchain for the, for the Bitcoin blockchain. So data equals money now in a very real sense. The last one I would like to touch upon is the issue of you know, security, right? That centralized equals secure. And time and time again, you can open the, the newspaper, Equifax, et cetera, that in fact, centralized doesn't mean secure. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to get to here is that I think there are a new set of assumptions with digital manufacturing, digital production, where we can track rights and we can also pay that enables a different conversation to be had today. And so I'm very interested in hearing from the rest of you on what those assumptions might be, what we can surface them so that we don't make thinking mistakes. Thank you. Works now. Thank you. Red button. Red button. <laughs>
Thanks so much for um, explaining what, I guess, three paradigm shifts that, that, that you're seeing here. Um, and I think before we open um, the floor for everybody's interventions, and uh, we will want to hear from everybody here, um, I want to give it over to, to Jorge. Um, maybe as a segue, I think the last paradigm shift is, is uh, in the Wikimedia universe, certainly um, the most important one um, that centralized isn't necessarily the way to go, but decentralized, distributed, democratic um, knowledge. Um, could I just add one point, which yes. is just to create some friction okay. and have a different discussion. Um, I don't actually believe in solutions, right? I believe in providing tools, powerful tools like Wikimedia, what the tools that you produced, and the means of, 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 of those providing those employees to empower them in some sense. So I don't believe in solutions. I believe in tools over solutions. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, and, and maybe um, sort of to pick up that thread again and, and also make give you sort of a pedestal here. Um, I think at Wikimedia we also tend to say we support Wikipedia, we don't build Wikipedia, right? We don't provide a solution to knowledge, but we try to give tools um, and, yeah, hopefully you have something equally smart to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. No, no, we're good. I don't think I have something as smart as what you just said, Jan, but thank you. Um, I have some slides up there, thanks. Well, in the meantime, let me uh, introduce myself again very quickly. First of all, thank you for having me here. My name is Jorge Vargas, and I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation is the nonprofit that, as Jan was saying, supports and is basically behind the scenes of Wikipedia, and not just Wikipedia, but many other knowledge projects uh, built by a wonderful community of millions of people around the world. And um, I come here to basically talk a little bit about what we do in the space of digital social innovation and how we believe that the Wikimedia movement is one that can um, definitely play a very powerful um, role in how we see growth in digital innovation in the global south or in emerging countries. As many of you uh, may see it. So uh, once again, thank you. I know that it's late. Maybe some of us are already uh, expecting a little bit of a rest and a beverage, but uh, appreciate you being with us. So Wikimedia and the power of digital social innovation. I think that first of all, a very quick introduction of like what is Wikimedia? Because oftentimes people see Wikimedia, Wikipedia, where is the difference there? So the Wikimedia Foundation, as I was mentioning, is a nonprofit that is based in San Francisco and it's, gonna, it's quite small relatively for the uh, mission that it supports uh, with around 300 people based in San Francisco but with a very global mission. And that global mission is to support Wikipedia among many other knowledge projects. So I do hope that you have heard of or know of Wikipedia, which it's something that maybe for some of us it's granted, but many people in the world are actually not aware of what Wikipedia is, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. But with that in mind, uh, we basically have a mission where we see ourselves supporting free knowledge for the world. And because of free knowledge for the world, right now and after 17 years of a lot of work, of volunteer hours, of amazing people behind the scenes, we have a Wikipedia in over 300 languages with over 45 million articles and over 3 billion edits. And this is something that is just impressive. Like right now or even while we were in our coffee break, more than a billion unique devices in the world every month go to Wikipedia and just to think of like the magnitude of that actually over 350 times a minute people are accessing Wikipedia right now and that's impressive and I think that that leaves us in the foundation as well with the responsibility of thinking how we can take this mission of making things that are free and that are open around the world but especially how we can take this to uh, every single part of the world, which is part of our vision statement, in which we believe that we imagine a world in which every single human being has access to the sum of all knowledge. And we definitely think and we believe that this makes the world better. And we think that this makes the world better because we're thinking of a world that is more educated, a world that is more informed, a world that is more sustainable, and a world that is more democratic. 
And that goes back again to our vision statement, which is imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. And that's very tricky because as this line said, which is uh, kind of a joke, but at the same time, it's pretty much true. The problem with Wikipedia is that it only works in practice because in theory, it's a total disaster. We're talking about millions of people that are basically editing without any restriction of uh, having to disclose who they are, but following a series of rules, a series of uh, guidelines on how they should be portraying the information there. And we want to capture all of that information. So just a couple of stats there. Uh, Wikipedia started in 2001, as, as I mentioned. It's written by thousands of volunteers around the world. No one is paid. And right now, there are over 45 million articles, uh, over 200,000 monthly editors, and what are approximately right now 300 million um, language, sorry, 300 language versions. And as I said, uh, although everyone can edit Wikipedia right now from your phone, from your desktop, there are in fact certain rules, and this is just something that I bring up to uh, clarify a little of that question of, oh, anyone can edit Wikipedia, anyone can say whatever they want, and actually Wikipedia is an encyclopedia that anyone can edit as long as some uh, pillars and some rules are followed. So for instance, Wikipedia is written from a neutral point of view, it's uh, free for content for anyone that uh, wants to use it, edit, distribute, and uh, basically everyone also has to treat each other with respect, civility, and there are many other rules and guidelines around this, and this is just a little peek. But going back to Wikimedia, I just want to go back to this idea that in order to capture the sum of all knowledge, we cannot just limit ourselves to an encyclopedia like Wikipedia. And because of that, there are other knowledge projects that the Wikimedia Foundation supports and that are part of the Wikimedia movement, such as Wikiquote, Wikimedia Commons, Wikiversity, Wikisource, which are all different versions of how to capture knowledge in order to be able to add to all of this magnificent democratic collaboration of bringing things that uh, our information and that empower people around the world. And as I've been saying often, this is made possible by people. People that look in many different ways, people that start very young, people that are just wrapping up their lives, people that have limited access, people that have a lot of access. But because of that, we believe that because we are made possible by people, we are a social movement. And that is something that we feel that needs to be represented and needs to be represented equally. And that's why I want to think of and I want to propose to you all this idea that the Wikimedia movement can serve as a tool for digital social innovation in the global south as an empowerment towards bringing knowledge that sometimes is trapped by different biases or by different barriers that cannot let things just surface to the world. And this is basically because, as we all know, also, knowledge is constantly expanding and knowledge is constantly evolving. And the problem with that is that as knowledge expands, as knowledge evolves, oftentimes technology or people in these different parts of the world cannot keep the same track as knowledge evolves and as technology keeps growing. And that's why oftentimes we think of what about the issues around access? How about the issues around how connectivity can uh, be a complication for people to go online and edit Wikipedia or read Wikipedia? So that also brings us to this question of how can we innovate in the global south, which is the question that brings us here today. And we've all seen this endlessly years go through on IGF and other places, right? We know that there's a lot of people that are not online. And we often talk about the issues around infrastructure, the issues around affordability, the issues around digital skills. But I want to focus a little bit on the piece around lack of relevant content. Oftentimes, people in the world are not going to the internet because they don't care about what the internet offers to them. It's not written in a language that they can understand, or it's not written in a way that they want to read about, or see about, or listen around. So because of this, and this also, uh, just to frame a little bit of the context, is the fact that we are um, facing a very big challenge in the world right now that oftentimes is ignored or hindered by other barriers to access, and is the fact that there is a very strong lack of relevant content online, and this is a very big barrier to access. An example for this is just the fact that history is fragile. Things can burn down, things can get destroyed over time, and because of this, if things are not digital, 
they're just going to fade away. And that's why we strongly believe that there has to be a way in which every single person cannot just read, cannot just investigate, but can also contribute in the sum of all knowledge. And we sometimes even make it harder, and we even create additional barriers to that, right? So for instance, we humans and we and our laws just like to find ways to create even more obstacles for free knowledge to be up there. There are challenges and complications that impede some of the information that could be up online, trapped behind, no, be, behind some knowledge barriers of laws like the lack of freedom of panorama in certain places, copyright issues that are keeping the information, and that's just additional barriers to a very big barrier that already exists in the world. Another barrier that I think is very relevant for us is the fact that we in Wikipedia believe that we are a reflection of the world and we are a reflection of the internet. And because of that, the internet is one that is biased. The internet is one that is built or was built by literate people, usually coming from the West, usually coming from certain economic status, oftentimes coming from certain contexts in society. And it's not a reflection of what humanity actually is. And we know that Wikipedia has a lot of challenges for that. And this is just a reflection of how, uh, and this is out of a recent measurement that we made, we realize that Wikipedia is something that is not even widely known in the world. So we all think, or we all here believe that Wikipedia is something that anyone would know what it is. But if we made a survey in Brazil, Nigeria, Iraq, or India where we did, we would realize that over uh, less than 20% of internet users would know what Wikipedia is. And we're doing some efforts around that, and I can share some examples later on, and uh, I, I, I could extend of a lot of really cool examples of where we're working, but um, we're doing awareness campaigns in order to let people know, as of just any other ad that people are doing. Uh, we're supporting with some of our grantees. This is an example of Blossom, a community member in Nigeria that started a quiz, learn it on Wikipedia on radio, just to find a way to let more people know that Wikipedia actually exists. And another way in which we try to replicate this is thanks to institutional partners and allies that just let us put all of that information that we believe should be online on Wikipedia or Wikimedia projects thanks to different partnerships and collaborations that we have. A very quick example that I can share with you is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York that released over 350,000 images to the public domain. And this is information that is now going up on Wikimedia Commons and on Wikipedia. And thanks to that, if you look at the multiplier effect that the open, the open life and the open access has on Wikimedia, um, that red little line is all that artwork that was trapped behind the metmuseum.org website and as soon as it was released, just the Wikipedia article in English immediately exponentially grew. And that's just the multiplier effect that Wikimedia can provide. And I think that these are all challenges that just keep showing us how we're all here to figure it out, but we're all here in this wonderful table with microphones, internet that kind of works. but. We just need to find a way to solve this. And the only way to do this is if we do this together. And that's where I will end my intervention. I have some examples to share as well, but I want to leave some time for us to just uh, share a little bit more of what we can be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Um, so maybe as a, as a two sentence summary of the two, in, um, two statements we just heard, we can say that we sort of live in a, I guess, post-Bitcoin era that that Pindar um, just uh, postulated here. Um, permissionless monetization, and I think, on the other hand, what we heard from Jorge about uh, the Wikimedia <coughs> universe, we have maybe permissionless knowledge. Um, but often, I ask myself, what do we do with this knowledge? How does this transform? into innovation? What's the application of this knowledge? Right? How do we get from knowledge to understanding that would go into innovation, probably? Um, and um, I think some barriers or some challenges around this um, are inclusion. How do we make sure everybody can be part of this? Um, or local language, local content is, is certainly a challenge here. Um, and, and how do we make sure that the infrastructure is in place that people can benefit from from this new 
environment in which we find ourselves. Um, how do we make sure they have the skills um, to, to make sure when they do understand what, what they're provided with to put this in action? Um, and finally, how can we actually then make this happen? Like how can, how can what's the role of institutions, of states, of, of also private actors to, to make this happen? And um, um, I think we, this is a good moment to, to hear from all of you initial reactions to, to these two statements, but also um, to uh, Christian's um, overview of digital social innovation. Um, and, and when Pindar, of course, um, pointed out that geographic limitations may not apply, maybe we've heard in many sessions Global South is a term that should not apply. Um, maybe we talk about emerging countries, we talk about um, countries where um, any of these challenges that I mentioned are still large challenges, um, barriers. Um, I think um, this, I really want to open the floor now to, to everybody in the room. Are there any initial um, reactions? I, um, maybe I'll just, um, we go one by one. Um, and feel free to refer to the interventions, um, maybe also add other thoughts. Um, and please um, speak into the microphone when you do and mention your name again. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, uh, Deepak here from India. So as Christian just mentioned, uh, content not only to be consumed, but also to be created uh, by people. I think the two other challenges related to that, one is in terms of, even in Wikipedia, if we see most of the content is in text, uh, whereas a lot of people in the Global South or whatever we call it, have the basic challenge of literacy, even in the local language. So even in the mother tongue, they don't have a functional literacy. And that's where the tools like, uh, we, we just saw some examples, for example, from India, which was showing on the mobile phone on the screen, uh, in terms of audiovisual content. I think that, that's becoming more relevant. The second thing related to that is the type of infrastructure that is or should be there. Because traditionally, if you see, when the internet started, it was symmetric. So pe people were doing email or other stuff, it, or file transfer, so it was almost symmetric transfer. And with the almost 25 years back, uh, with the web, it became highly asymmetric. And that's why we had all these notions about one is to four. So you could download at four times the speed, and one time it could go up. I think increasingly in the recent past, things again are changing in terms of user behavior, that people are uploading a lot of stuff, especially on social media, but even otherwise. And to that extent, uh, we need to recreate the basic infrastructure also of the internet in terms of the physical infrastructure, the way things are being done. And that takes me to the last point, which is, uh, I mean, almost 45 years back, uh, Alvin Toffler had also postulated this uh, in his uh, seminal work, Future Shock, uh, that in future people will not just be producers or consumers, they'll be prosumers. Thank you. Yeah, hi. So, yeah, one is like an open question, I, I guess there's, there's probably no, no like a specific answer, but we'd we'll like Please to hear some. Please state your name again for uh, the transcript. Just your name again for oh, the transcript. Yeah, Ri Ricardo Zapata. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, probably like to hear some some remarks or comments on that. And is is something that that I realized uh, here. We talked about a like a market approach to digital social innovations, and uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, I'll say, is is kind of a commons approach. Uh, also to, to social innovation. And yesterday in the GovTech Summit uh, in, the, in the Hotel de Ville, I don't know if you've been there, but there was this discussion also, it, it, and it was uh, should civic tech, they were talking about civic tech, should civic tech should be left to the market forces, should be governed by the states, uh, or should be left like into the commons, uh, I don't know, the commons is, is quite a complicated concept, but, but like on a multi-stakeholder approach to govern the, the, the ecosystem. And uh, it's kind of the, 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 the question I, I will also like to pose, uh, uh, should we leave it to the market, to the state, or, or to the commons? Uh, and, and probably Wikimedia should have something to say about the, the commons, and, and is the commons like a good approach to social innovation, or is there still a place for market and state intervention uh, in fostering social innovation? Uh, 
I like what Pinder said. Oh, yeah, Stefan from QX. I, I would like to, to, to go along with um, what Pinder said about like solutions are not where we should start, but rather like a consequence of what we do. Uh, when we started QX and offline distribution, uh, clearly one of our co-founders were based in Mali, so the, the target population were schools in Africa. Uh, if we'd stayed with that, we'd be well below what we have. We have currently a little more than 3 million users that we can actually count, so it's probably more. Uh, but in Africa, it's, it's like a vast minority. Um, we found out through the newspaper that it's actually, uh, QX is being used to distribute Wikipedia in North Korea because they find it's a best propaganda because it's not propaganda, but it was never meant to be. It's just like a side effect of having our program as an open source um, product. And that's where I want to, to come to and also to the idea of commons. I think the, the, the notion of open source is very important in the digital world. If you recall, if you read that book about uh, Steve Jobs, during the first years at Apple, they had a pirate flag on top of the building, and they literally were stealing their code from Xerox. And now you got Apple products, but you got Windows, and you got things that work. It's like literally they took code somewhere else, they reused it for the better part. It was not open, but definitely it was for the better part. So I think we're in a world where we used to defend what we've produced, and it was good, and we made money out of it, but now if we share it, we actually make a lot more money out of it. And what Jorge showed on his example with the Met and how many people would actually access the content by opening it is really the, 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 the sticky point to, to what we should do. However, you need to pay for that innovation, and for that I have no solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thomas Gunn uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, uh, regarding the global south, uh, uh, particularly in Africa, I think the major uh, challenge or the major problem is uh, the issue of access to the Internet. Uh, because uh, only 22% of African population has uh, access to the Internet. Uh, if you go to the individual countries, for example in Ethiopia, only 15% of the population has access to the Internet. So the major, uh, the major point for this uh, inclu uh, inclusiveness uh, is the access, the infrastructural access uh, is at the top of uh, the list. Uh, regarding the uh, Wikipedia, uh, my, my, my brother's presentation, uh, I want to uh, mention a point that uh, how do you see the accuracy, or uh, is Wikipedia working only on the, uh, it is uh, coverage only, how do you see the accuracy? Because I have an uh, occasion that while I was an undergraduate student, uh, while I was uh, doing a presentation, I mentioned Wikipedia as uh, reference, and my professor was uh, shouted at me why you cite Wikipedia, and uh, I w uh, this is a good opportunity for me to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to ask this question. Thank you. Uh, on the subject of, on the subject of, um, Right. My name is um, Akua Walters. I'm a company hacker hostel. We train software engineers in emerging markets. Um, we did a we did a case we did a weird case study um, of our business model um, in Saint Lucia because, like I said, we train software engineers, right? But Saint Lucia is a market where is a country where they don't have any tertiary um, level institutions. So once you leave high school, um, that's it for your education. So what we ended up so what we ended up doing there was instead of teaching them how to code, we taught them the, the basic, we gave them tools um, how to test ideas really quickly and how to get somebody to pay you for it. Because, they, because here's the deal, the, 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 the technology to, to scale these ideas um, are known. Um, not too far away is Trinidad and Tobago that produces like, um, like maybe 200 engineers a year. Um, uh, so it's not hard to find the talent to, to bring these ideas to, to, to market. I think the problem is how do we how do we teach the, the local uh, local individuals um, in these in these developing markets um, uh, like Ethiopia um, how to how to look for ideas that that are uh, valuable that get people to pay you, and then and then bringing the talent um, to them to build those valuable businesses. I think we we might. 
we might be looking at it, uh, looking at the problem uh, from a, a tricky angle in trying to in trying to teach them how to code or bringing technology to them um, in that way. My name is Andres Lombana uh, from the Berman Klein Center. I, I was struck by the issue of like uh, data equals money that uh, yeah, you, you, you mentioned. And for the Global South, this is very interesting because, you know, like we have little access to the data, for instance, that is created in all these platforms. And a lot of the innovation, like for instance, um, social innovators who don't have uh, access to like servers, so they are using like probably Facebook or YouTube or like uh, social media platforms. Um, the lack of data also kind of uh, let them innovate, but the profit is not going to them. Uh, most of the profit that is created uh, with this data. And I wonder like how, for instance, a model like Wikipedia, I don't know if you offer like data analysis in your service, but I don't think so, but Wiki, w I mean, what is the future of Wikipedia Foundation or Wikimedia Foundation if, if you want to also provide not only knowledge creation, but knowledge processing and testing of uh, AI and algorithms? Hi, so my name is Rafael Palomino, and I have a question for, um, same for the Wikipedia presentation. Um, I mean, I think what you were kind of saying is we can assume that there's a positive end to more knowledge, right? And that this knowledge is then influenced by those with access to the tools. Um, so what tells us that if we then give the access or the tools to this 3.8 more billion, that that would be like a direction towards the same positive goal of knowledge, right? I mean, it's usually be miscarried into something negative. I mean, there's like, we see it now with technology, I don't know, in, like in Brazil, or in elections, misinformation, so then how do we structure it from the get-go so that the purpose of knowledge is positive, and what does Wikipedia does for this? Um, because also the, I mean, the map you were showing with more access was mostly in Western countries, and that's what we're seeing mostly misinformation. So then how do we make sure that doesn't happen elsewhere where we take this infrastructure also? Hello, my name is Joshua Msasizi. I'm from Uganda. As I said, I work with Uganda, Internet Society Uganda chapter. Uh, Wikipedia is really needed to help in educational resources. And uh, as, I, as I say, Uganda chapter implemented a project on uh, Wikipedia and uh, we managed to upload a number of uh, articles in Luganda version. Luganda is one of the indigenous languages in Uganda. So we managed to upload like 300 articles uh, on Wikipedia Uganda version. But uh, the problem we were facing when we reached uh, up country areas, there is really uneven distribution of uh, internet infrastructure. So this is still a problem in developing countries. And uh, currently in Uganda, there is a uh, a social media tax that was implemented. So as we fight so much to connect the unconnected, there is still that gap, even those that are connected, that are being disconnected by such uh, policies. So how, what can we do about that? Thank you. How are we on time? Uh, uh, we're doing good. We have uh, 30 more minutes. Can I, can I show like a couple of slides with some examples that could maybe take it away? So I just I, I just wanted to show like maybe and and uh, answering some of the questions and because I wanted to touch a little bit of the points around is uh, this idea of civic tech that Ricardo was bringing up regarding is it something that we should just let to and this is around slide 45. Yep, yeah, thanks. Uh, the um, around like should we just leave this to the commons or should we like find just or does the government or the private sector should play any role in this issue and definitely I think and we think in the foundation that the the hard answer is yes everyone should play a role and that's why I think that I ended that introduction by saying that we should be working together and the role that I have in the foundation uh, is that of doing actual partnerships with not just other nonprofits or within our community, but um, with other uh, for profit companies that are mission aligned, governments that want to work with us. So if you go to uh, this, this sli it's slide 44. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to show something very quickly around a project that we're doing in partnership with Google called uh, Project Tiger. 
Basically, what we are identifying is a lack of relevant content in India. And this is a pilot that we ran for over five months. And basically, what we did with Project Tiger was to look what, was, what people was looking for in Google and then realizing what didn't have a Wikipedia article as a Google result. So in that way, we were looking at what were people actually looking for but what was not showing a relevant article in a local language. So we kind of took English and Hindi aside, and we're looking into Odia, we're looking into Gujarati, we're looking into Punjabi, etc. And touching to your point that it's not just about putting the tool there and like just letting it be there, but there are other challenges around. We also realized that there are two big things that were impeding people in this local languages, local language communities to uh, put that content out there. So training was one, and that's something that our community is doing a lot, but there was also a very big complication in lack of actual hardware. People didn't have the actual technology to be able to contribute online. And there are also some difficulties in order to go online because it was very expensive for them to use the internet for editathons. So in partnership with Google, what we did was to provide some computers to these communities provide some internet stipends in order to surpass the challenges around connectivity. We provided the training and we provided the support in order to produce those articles. And we just created a contest between the different language communities. And we were aiming for 2,000 articles and over 4,500 articles were created in over 10 languages in India. And this was just to show that we cannot work alone. We cannot just say Wikipedia is there and the platform's there and anyone can edit and let it there. But we need to find who are those institutional partners that can help us in the ground. All in all, always being sure that we're complying with guidelines, that we're mission aligned, that our values are respected, that the values of our movement are respected. And that is just a quick example. There's another an example touching, and if we can just jump a couple of slides very quickly, talking about digital literacy. Uh, if you can go back uh, there. Uh, this is a very quick example of a partnership that we did with the GSMA, uh, something called MIST, which is a mobile internet skills training toolkit. We all think that Wikipedia is easy to use, <laughs> And actually, the internet is not easy to use for people that are just getting online. So if we're just giving Wikipedia to people, but we're not helping support them, how can they look for an article? How can they find an article in their local language? We're not doing anything by just creating that tool. So we created a module that we added in partnership with GSMA to this training toolkit in which the GSMA partnering with some mobile operators they're training um, their employees for them to train or create some local trainings in some communities that are buying their phones for the first time or starting to go online on how to use Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, YouTube, and Wikipedia. So thanks to that, we have trained over 350,000 people. We basically explain the benefits of what do you do when you go online. And we are basically working towards achieving this sustainable development goal number four around education, right? We want to be sure that we're not just putting the tool out there, like some people were discussing, like digital social innovation is not just coming by putting the tool itself, but by finding the proper partners and by finding the ways in which we can work together to make those tools into action, to have those people trained to read Wikipedia, to have those people trained to contribute Wikipedia. And those are two examples of partnerships that we are doing. And this is just kind of like a universe of ideas that we're just trying to figure out how we can do, do more than just putting the website up, which was pretty much our efforts in the past years. But now thinking, OK, Wikipedia is up there, but how can we actually make this happen? And just to quickly touch on your, on your point, I, I, I forget your name. Um, it is very important that. Um, all of this is being done with certain guidelines, with certain rules, with certain values, and we, we pride ourselves in the Wikimedia movement of having these rules around transparency, around very, having a very strong data protection, around being very sure that the content is there, is following certain guidelines, around accuracy, there are some things, and I'll be happy to share with you the answer of what I would give to my teacher and teacher to the accuracy question. But it's, it, it's around like, it's not just content that anyone can edit and you can just say whatever you want to say. There are rules, there are guidelines. You need a source. Wikipedia is an entry point. The idea is that 
not just Wikipedia, but anything that you read in the internet, you should be double checking with something else. You should not be just copying, pasting, and believing everything you read out there. So we, we, that's 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 the message there. That um, it's about putting the tool. It's about finding the proper partners and a lot of different stakeholders that can put the tool into action and be sure that that tool is being used with certain values and with certain guidelines and rules in order to guarantee that it's being used for good. Jorge, maybe covered, to, like, to follow up on, uh, on, on that, and maybe also a, a question for Pindar, but when listening to the different interventions, again, I, I work on young people at Berkman Klein. Uh, it seems like many of you mentioned as a first condition kind of access challenges that uh, kind of are barriers for innovation. And then several of you mentioned kind of as a second step, uh, it's about skills. So how do we enable or provide people with the right skills? or equip them with the right skills in order to be able to then innovate. But what, what I'm interested in, and I, I do work with my colleague Andres on, is to figure out, okay, if, if we're in a situation where there is access and we feel like we have trained people on these issues, what still then inhibits them or, or prevents them to, from innovating? And in many cases, uh, in, in, my, in my world, it's about the parent or family environment or it's gender issues or it's other issues. So I'm curious, since you come from so many parts of the world, what, what do you see happening? Yeah. Um, so I'd be happy to take a stab at this one really quickly. Um, like I said, um, in, in St. Lucia, um, the problem, the problem isn't so much that the that the technologies to, to bring these things, these ideas to market don't exist. The problem is that there there isn't a focus on market driven innovation. There is a there's a focus on if we can get these guys money, if we can get these guys internet, if we can get these guys a space to work, then maybe uh, maybe something will come out of that. Versus looking at um, what are the well, yeah right like the market, what markets um, exist what markets exist um, to pay these guys to begin with because these development funds run out, um, uh, projects sunset. But when we talk about sustainability, there isn't, uh, there isn't a focus on market-driven approaches to, 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 to a lot of these um, sustainability projects. Carlton Samuels, uh, Pindar, you said it's, I don't give solutions. What I talk about is tools for solutions. Now that's the same idea we're trying to, to, to inculcate in our people. We give them tools and solutions and let the, uh, the questions of what is it that we want to do come from out there. And then they, there's a market and then we look at what the market will do for it and we push that. That's, that's uh, what we found in years of developing uh, talent uh, for uh, mobile application development because we thought we could just get into, get a whole bunch of people uh, trained in mobile development and let them loose and they were going to be magic, everybody was going to be happy. That's, it didn't quite work that way. So this is, this is the, the, the focus now in providing tools to build solutions and then you go out there, win out the market to see what the market is demanding for solutions. Can I just play back for that? I mean, it's, it's kind of also through bitter experience that I'm, I'm trying to provide at least my opinion on that. But th there's a reason for that, and that is uh, really twofold. The first is uh, local context. I can't claim to know what the local context is. And with the internet, everywhere is local now, because geography doesn't matter. It's about topology. But the second point is complexity, and that's actually quite a serious point which is the complexity of these eco ecosystems. It's a little bit different from a garden. I like the garden analogy to, to sort of grow things, but if we're looking at a rainforest, these things evolve. And so what I talk about is building tools to grow solutions, uh, whatever they may be, because of the complexity of local ecosystems and contexts where everything is local. I think what's different though, and I, and I want to push back a little bit on the market thinking, because the market is used I think that's a bit of a sort of a, a, a thought trap, okay? And, and the, the market is used as the way that we, we, we determine prices and the complexity of an ecosystem, that we all just go and the market somehow magically decides. Well, I push back on that for two reasons. First of all, the markets fail. 
right? And then there, there could be a role for regulation to make sure that markets don't fail, or in the event that they do fail, that there is a recovery mode. But more importantly, is because markets assume this, this, this notion of money, which is actually a kind of boring zero-sum asset. Either I have it or you have it. And we had to, inv I think Bitcoin invented digital scarcity, right? Which is kind of ironic because in digital, nothing is scarce. We, we could, you know, it's very easy to copy someone else's property. So the innovation here is that we had to invent sort of digital scarcity so that we can start thinking about markets in the space where everything was in some sense infinite. What I think is interesting about cryptocurrency specifically is that we can now design incentives because the language of money is very, very powerful. We can make money literally now with a command line and you can build community through a cryptocurrency where you design your incentives. I think that's generally called, um, currently the name is called token economics. And the example that I want to use is creating markets for data or high quality data for AI deep learning. And so there is a protocol, I declare sort of, I'm an advisor to this, because everyone's got a shell on this thing. It's called the Ocean Protocol. And so the whole point is how do you have my data, my rules, because that's what we, we want, we have a change in architecture here. My data, my rules, but then how can I get the, the reward? And so because we can design incentive systems at quite granular levels, which don't necessarily have to be zero sum, either I have it or you have it, we can design, there's a new tool in our toolbox both on policy side as well as technology. The problem with the tech, on the policy side is with innovation is that often it's disruptive, right? You're breaking rules, whereas regulation is enforcing rules. So how do you enforce the rules and break the rules at the same time? Well, you can't. And so that's the problem I think that, that Sanjo was mentioning. I dropped out of university to start the first ISP in Hong Kong in 1993, right? I didn't speak to my parents for many years because being a scholar with a potential PhD at 23, 24, it was like the, the, the cultural number one is to be a gentleman and a scholar. Well, you can tell by my awkward sense of humor that I'm neither a gentleman and I'm certainly not a scholar. So when you have cultural context with you where you're not expected to work because of your gender or whatever, that is probably the biggest impediment to innovation. So I would argue that it's regulation, but cultural regulation or cultural norms together with the rule of law Right? No one is above the rule of law, but no, one is, no nation is below the sort of mathematics, that we have a new kind of discussion that can emerge. I don't know what the parameters are, but I think we can have a new thing, it's talking about tools over solutions and designing incentives to build communities wherever they may be. This is the thing. When we say market here, it's really about a, a place where incentives kind of collide and bring together. That's, that's what we're talking about here. It's not, we're not talking about... Um, NYC kind of market. <laughs> We're talking about a place where there are incentives. Incentives can be any kind. Right. It could be Bitcoin. It could be, it, it, it could be a social enterprise in which the social value is, is added. That's, that's what we're talking sure. about. Sure, so and, and that's great, so we have an understanding. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a much wider of, concept. They're, they're the new kinds of markets now, again, because we've got this new P2P cryptocurrency. Right. You know, look at um, uh, openbazaar.io, okay, which is a P2P marketplace, and their, their provenance now, you can download the code, it's all on GitHub anyway, is that it's not about trade, tr uh, free trade, it's about trade free. It's about building peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces that you're not gated by your platform monopoly e-commerce, They've both been with A, apparently. Either one. Doesn't matter because now we can deal commercially and settle with goods and services with Open Bazaar and it's just software. So many of the institutions that we're building right now for the new rules of whatever game we're playing are no longer buildings with people f and rules per se. But I think what we're doing is we're building institutions and software with the tools and with these sort of proto rules. And I think that's really exciting. Any other reactions to this? Um, it's, it's funny, when I hear the word market, um, I think at Wikimedia we're sort of, not conditioned, but we tend to sort of like, have sort of a knee-jerk reaction, like market, uh, this is like incompatible with the commons. Yeah. But it's, I think it is, a, I think it's actually, it actually makes sense to think about markets in this context as well, because there is a sustainability, as you say, uh, com, com, uh, component to this, right? and uh, markets are complex and cultural uh, sensitivities, cultural barriers 
work in there as well. Um, and so I find this, I think too often we do play sort of the commons versus the market, but maybe there's, there's it's probably a spectrum, right? It's not, it's not, it's not a binary choice here. Um, so, so that's, that's also the term digital social innovation actually sort of is maybe misleading. It sends us towards the commons more than towards the market, but um, actually that's at least how I react to the term. Um, but um, we need a new word. Create a word. No one knows about it. Should we come up with one right Let's do now. it today. Come on. <laughs> right. um, any other reactions to this? Yes. Just quickly, when, um, when you were talking about innovation within young people in the, say, what's called the global south, I mean, if you realize that people in these countries, most of their access to the internet, we call the internet in general, uh, is through things like WhatsApp, Facebook, you know, like the typical huge platforms. Maybe there are ways for, or we could find ways for them to innovate on existing on these platforms at the same time, right? So if we think of innovation as a thing that could come from just five guys meeting in high school, that might not happen unless it's on these structures. And as they were saying, like <laughs> partnering with, I mean, it sounds horrible because we should be probably against Facebook and WhatsApp, but it might be the only way for us to actually reach these people and lead them to, to innovate. So I don't know whether you've done stuff like this and what, how we could actually explore this. I do, I mean, I, I don't think necessarily you have to uh, convince people to move away from what they're already using. The switching costs are relatively high. Um, but for me, for me, innovation is not just about where it's happening. So I'm fine if they innovate while they are on Snapchat or on whatever other platform. But it's more how do you push them young people in this case, to think outside the box, to, um, to convene amongst each other, to collaborate on certain things, uh, to experiment, to uh, employ more kind of design thinking, what Andres is working on. Um, so I, I'm a little bit less concerned which platform it's happening as long as I see something moving and then I can still, once I see it moving, I can say, are you sure this is the right place to do it? Or maybe we use that energy over here and yeah, yeah go somewhere else. Iterate. <laughs> so I have some comment um, from the experience, particularly in Chile, and maybe it's the downside, downside of innovation uh, or one of the downsides in the way that one of the questions could be, do we want all youth to innovate? Do we need all youth to innovate? This is a question, for instance, in Chile now it uh, becomes like a fashion that all the funding from the government and from the few important organizations that, that provide funding, it goes to social innovation. If you see the formularies to apply for funding, you have to innovate, and sometimes they don't even explain what it's innovation. And there are a lot of social organizations that work in daily routines that maybe are not associated with innovation, that they are not getting more funding because it's not innovative. It's daily routine of social work. Um, so for me, this is a question that we should think when we talk about like promoting innovation, like if it were like universally positive, but sometimes it's not. It's just that. And and um and, and I applaud that thinking. Um, it, it goes back again um to to the idea that that I'm trying to to um to bring forth, which is we need to make sure that when we talk about when we talk about innovation and and, and should youths innovate, that we take an approach that provides the ma so, uh, provides the maximum returns for uh, for those goals whatever the, the the funds were given for and that after those funds are depleted they're replenished by as i like as i like to say the market because even these even these these uh, these uh, there are a lot of social um, there are a lot of social good companies um, that exist that do social good and are rewarded for it um, not because of the social good, but because they are contributing um, like real value um, to the market and they're rewarded for it with money. Um, uh, Tom's, for instance, comes to mind um, when you think about this, regardless of what you might think about the result of their giving away shoes in Africa. 
um, and, and what that does to the local uh, markets. Uh, but we should look and, fo and try to ensure that when these funds are depleted, they are, they are replenished um, by the exchange of value from these institutions. Um, I was comment Christian yesterday night <laughs> in the restaurant um, that one interesting way to approach, uh, at least from developing countries, the idea of um, digital innovation or digital economy as well is to maybe we can do like a mapping of how the calls for funding are shaping the subjects who can be uh, receiving the funding because in general if you I think if we do a content analysis of all different kind of uh, calls we can we can clearly see what kind of subjects are actually getting the funding for innovation and we could probably be surprised as well. Maybe one addition would be to question our own definition of innovation because for me innovation can happen in any kind of space in academia even within yourself that for me innovation is more pushing the boundaries or exploring outside of the existing parameters and boxes that you are in so to see how can you not necessarily change or improve, but uh, just look outside of what exists. To me, that's already trying to innovate. And in that sense, most of the associations with innovation are around building technical tools to improve society in a way. And that's not necessarily how I mean it. Just to add on this definition of innovation, so I'm from Hong Kong where we have one of the highest cost of living. It's actually very, very difficult for us to innovate because of the high cost of living. So what I would offer is two simplistic uh, views uh, given what's emerged. So one view is with linear incremental innovation, right, where, the, where you basically argue, you know, how is it better, faster, cheaper, or safer, right? That's it. Right, because unless you can uh, articulate what's be BFCS, right, better, faster, cheaper, or safer, then you, you know your your idea is not as crystallized, or your innovation is not quite as crystallized as you think it would be. The second kind is different. It's not linear, incremental that we do every year, eight or ten percent improve, polish, 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 but breakthrough innovation, where you're looking at a thousand x or ten thousand x improvements, and that's the second class of innovation. But what can you do that previously could not have been done before? And they're kind of different. Like now we can route value over the internet, anywhere on the internet. Well, we couldn't do that before. That's kind of interesting. So within these two, I think it, 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 it behooves us to, to try and make a, that kind of distinction. Which one are you talking about? I would argue that policymakers love linear incremental. They hate breakthrough innovation. Right? Because they lose control. And then they use regulation as well. You need to have this license and that license, what have you. Or, yeah, exactly. So, you know, innovate, but, but don't innovate too much, right? <laughs> you can't. Yes. Oh, one last comment here before we yeah. actually run out of, two last comments before we run out of time. I commented, so I'll just do quickly. I'd be curious to know, actually, coming back to your question, like where is the difference between innovation and an innovative reuse of an existing technology? Um, it happened, for instance, uh, with, well, pretty much anything that we use today. Uh, it was meant in one way, it's being reused in another one, and it creates more value. So in that case, is it looking for innovation because no one's seen it before, or is it like, oh, we had this, it was like so-so, and now it's actually awesome. Um, I'd be curious to see where, which sustainable um, products are coming from where. I just wanted to add that you were looking for a word before, the, the commons and the market, and I think there is a word, the triple P, the public-private -priv partnerships that have existed in a long time. And I think we saw a really good example of the, the project, the Tiger project, um, using uh, working together with Google and then Wiki, Wikimedia and Wikipedia and probably schools as well. So, which are also a really good example for the commons. And I, I wanted to highlight again how thrilled I was 
um, to hear about the Tiger project because it sounds like you really didn't only provide tools and technology, but you also created a community and, and you, um, you made sure you respected the local context and all the languages and all of that. And because I think we hear a lot about projects of inclusion and then they, uh, people provide or projects provide money for technology and tools, but they forget about the whole work around building communities, motivating people to actually innovate, which, which I think is crucial for innovation because the tools themselves will not innovate. Thanks. Sounds like... Can I, can I just adjust the remark about... Yes. Uh, I think that was quite important. Another reason to, to, this, to build on this concept of what can be reused, and I think this is actually very, very important, because as we all know, most startups, et cetera, fail, right? for whatever reason, could bad management, didn't adjust the market need, or what have you. But tool, tools I like because tools can be repurposed and reused. So even though you might have put it in in this instance and it didn't work, doesn't mean that you can't reuse the tool. So I, in fact, not just tools over solutions, but tools that can also be reused. Because if, if we can make the tools better over time, we can tighten that loop. And I, I think that's, again, new with digital that, again, didn't exist in analog 15 years ago. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Um, it sounds like we could discuss this till tomorrow, 9 a.m., when the next session here starts. Um, unfortunately, we do have a time limit anyway, and I wanted to just now throw it back to Christian to sort of um, maybe provide us with a few thoughts in, in a, in a wrap-up. Thanks so much. I was <clears throat> actually I, I was actually afraid to uh, have Pinder being the last speaker because despite your comments, you have a very nice scholarly way of actually um, I think uh, <laughs> summarizing really really important thoughts in a very very um, easy to understand metaphor, right? And I'm a little bit afraid of actually not really having to offer much more than that. I would maybe just offer three reflections on the discussion which we had today. And I think what was interesting to me personally in terms of what I found striking in our discussion were um, three words or three concepts. Um, the concept of the market, the concept of uh, the incentive, and the notion of um, innovation. And I will try to explain that in a sentence or two. What I found interesting in our discussion about the market that we first of all talked about a market, right? And that we essentially um, approached the idea of digital social innovation also as something as market driven. But coming from the history of the internet, it was also interesting to me that we sometimes talk about markets already, right? Or at least we talked a little bit about markets in the 1990s when we talked about the market space of idea or the marketplace of idea. And interestingly enough, we um, kind of like have become a little bit uh, skeptical with this kind of like whole notion of marketplace ideas, right? Or at least the um, unleashed power of a marketplace idea when we talk about fake news or when we talk about credible information and so on and so forth. Um, I'm a professor of management, so I'm, course, I'm of course for uh, markets wherever you uh, can, right? It's just um, an interesting notion to think about on the one hand, uh, also in terms of understanding, right? Getting the balance right between the commons and the entrepreneurial motive and the profit motive. I think this also then nicely ties over to the idea of the incentive, right? And the idea of incentivizing people for uh, what they do. Um, not necessarily monetarily, right? Um, I mean, cryptocurrencies or so do not one-to-one -one maybe have to reflect a monetary value, but maybe in our discussion finding different ways of um, essentially make people look for solutions or even understand problems first, right? And I think maybe right now in our toolbox we do not really have the profit motive, quote unquote, right? To kind of like actually signal that when you develop an innovation to something, there might be something to be gained, right? Or at least to be gained by proxy. And I think the idea of um, new kind of like incentives or incentivizing people is a very interesting one. Of course, it also has to be balanced, of course, with the idea of do we over incentivize things where people would otherwise um, very much act on their own. Final notion which I found interesting is the idea of innovation, actually also what you said, um, that um, 
where do we strike the balance between essentially disruption, innovation, and uh, maintaining, right? And I guess for your work with Wikimedia or Wikipedia, um, it's also an interesting notion, right? Being the um, shining example of somebody who writes something and then the other ones who are essentially maintaining what there is, right? And what value has what. I would, however, very much agree with Sandra that um, I think it's a very much noble endeavor as a human being, right? To essentially push the boundaries, push the envelope, which innovation actually is. The question just boils then down to, and I think that's the discussion which we are having today, um, I think we always want to push boundaries or want to push the envelopes, right? But the um, discussion then also boils down to how do we um, provide people with tools, with ideas, with aspirations to, to do that. And um, I, I think a very interesting way to go forward, and it's a notion which you brought up and you brought up, is also to maybe um, share what there is, right? Kind of like, for instance, many social business ideas are somewhat repeatable. Um, give um, knowledge on a format which is uh, usable in a format in a, in, a, in a context where you might not have the digital infrastructure yet, right? Or offer something in local languages or so, where I think there are a lot of great local examples where we can only profit from um, making these um, ideas, services, and so on and so forth shareable, right? So not only sharing of knowledge, but also sharing of concepts, of ideas, of processes. And I think that is a very interesting um, way to go forward, right? So, yeah. That were my ideas, or my, my reflections, not my ideas. It's all your ideas, which I just summarized, and which I just kind of like claimed as mine, but I tried it. Repurposing other people's ideas. Isn't that what innovation is about? <laughs> uh, deep. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for honoring us with your presence late this afternoon. Um, thanks for the really insightful remarks and contributions. Um, and have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.